much. Good afternoon, everybody. Are you well? Excellent. Okay. So, as was mentioned, uh, I'm Steve Fennell from Plymouth University, and the topic of my talk this afternoon is around the issue of recognising and responding to the threats that we face with mobile devices. So, in terms of the structure of the talk, I'll begin with a little bit of scene setting, so hopefully there won't be too many surprises in what I'm going to say there, and hopefully, equally, there will be things that you recognise as being true about your use and our use of mobile devices in today's context. Then I'm going to move on to look at different aspects to which we need to really secure these devices to protect against certain types of threats and to safeguard both the devices and the data that we store on them. So particular things I'm going to focus on include user authentication, um, threats around leakage of data from the devices themselves, and malware threats. And somewhere along the line, I'll also talk about some of the physical risks that we can find the devices exposed to, such as loss and theft, and the safeguards that we can impose on the devices to perhaps help at least protect if those situations occur. And then finally, we'll have some conclusions and some opportunities for questions then. Okay, so here's a, a little quote just from a, a couple of weeks ago um, from an interview with, well, Microsoft's incoming chief executive officer, Satya Nadala. And he was asked, amongst other things, uh, taking over the reins there as the chief executive of this major technology corporation, how did he see the future for Microsoft? And the thing that, that caught my attention in his response was, he said, going forward, it's a mobile-first, cloud-first world. And... Well, from our perspective, I guess, given that we're already, I'm sure, quite dependent upon mobile technology, and I'm sure we're familiar to some degree with using the cloud, are we already then living in the future, so to speak? So how many of you, just for my interest, have at least one mobile device? Wave your hands in the air. Okay, well, most, most people, some people perhaps don't have hands, and we're not waving them. Um, so, so I say, this was a quote from... The, the chap who's now taken on the control of Microsoft, and this is how they see the company moving forward. So mobile technology, very significant for the future. And it's also been termed, I guess, the post-PC era, um, recognising that now, in many cases, our use of the technology is perhaps mobile first. We are moving much more towards using the sort of devices pictured on this slide as our primary information technology devices. So we've got tablets, we've got smartphones, and these are yeah, basically revolutionising the way we do things personally and the way that we do things in terms of organisations and businesses. And if we look at the capabilities of those devices, they are quite easily comparable to the sort of power that we would have found in desktop and laptop computers of just a few years ago. So they're capable of doing quite a great deal. So they've got very high volumes of storage. We can store vast amounts of information on them. It's not unusual to be carrying around a, a mobile device with 64, maybe even 128 gigabytes of storage. So you can get a fair amount within that. You've got very high levels of connectivity on the devices, so we're talking from the cellular mobile communications networks through things like Wi-Fi right down to personal communication networks such as Bluetooth, so many ways in which the devices can exchange and share information. And we've also, of course, got the capabilities of them running applications, so they can store and they can manipulate data within various application contexts. So the various apps that you can run on the smartphones and tablets give you many opportunities to store information that, that has value, both personally and potentially commercially. So just to give an illustration of some of the, the technology penetration, some, some survey findings from Ofcom, which is a UK organisation that looks at the regulation of the sector. 58% of the UK population, and this was back in 2012, have a smartphone, and 19% at that time had some sort of tablet device. So this is quite a high speed of adoption for these technologies, which really, relatively speaking, have only been around a short time, compared to, let's consider, desktop and laptop computers, which have been around for years, and have taken quite some time to reach that level of adoption and penetration amongst the populace. Looking at the Information Security Breaches Survey from the uh, UK Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, 
76%, so three quarters of businesses are allowing their staff to connect to the business's systems through smartphones and tablets. So there's a very high degree of access into systems which doubtless have sensitive data content happening from mobile devices. Then looking at findings from Ernst & Young's Global Information Security Survey from 2013, Almost half of them believe that uh, mobile computing, the use of mobile computing, has, has increased their exposure to attacks in the last 12 months. And 70% consider the security of these sort of devices to be important. So there's a recognized threat there, and it ought to be something that people are doing something about. It's a threat, it's an issue that businesses ought to be managing, and it's something that we as individuals, in terms of what we're carrying around, ought to be managing for ourselves as well. However, the way and the extent to which we're actually dealing with this is often quite variable. So I think it's fair to say that if you think about the sort of data that your post-PC device, your smartphone or your tablet is holding, they're holding pretty much the same sort of data as we were, now, we were previously holding on desktops and laptops, that we're accessing the same sort of services. But are we affording them the same level of protection? <coughs> and I would... I would argue, and I've got some evidence to, to support this later on, that the things that we do to protect those devices often aren't even comparable to the sorts of things that we would have previously done to protect the same data and the access to the same services on devices that are actually less vulnerable. So we're quite used to having passwords and passwords of a reasonable length, let's say, on desktop systems that we use in the office, etc., or that we have a, a, within the university. But the extent to which people have the same level even of password protection on a mobile device is sometimes not there at all. Okay, so people find passwords, and I'll, I'll explore this again a bit later, they find them less convenient to enter on a smartphone than they do on a full keyboard. And so perhaps they will compromise the level of protection because it's less convenient on the device, even though actually the data and services are pretty much the same. And I say this applies both in terms of our organisational use of the technology and as well as to personal considerations. And just to illustrate the way that people sometimes tend to think about their technology, this, this is some fairly, uh, well, I suppose, dated quotes. This was from, from some focus groups that we did back in 2007 as one of our research projects at Plymouth. And what we did then, we were asking users of well, then fairly basic mobile phones. So the, the, the idea of smartphones hadn't really appeared in such volume back at that point. But we were asking these mobile phone users about the extent to which they felt they were carrying around sensitive data on their devices. Okay, so back in that era, okay, you still had phones that could take photographs. They had various text messages, sometimes emails on them. <coughs> And the sorts of things we were hearing at the outset of these discussions are as depicted on the slide. So I'll, I'll read a couple of them. So as a general user, there's no data on there that I class as that sensitive. Um, I'm not sure anybody would want to steal my information. I don't perceive myself to be that important. And this was quite typical of the discussions we were having with the users. But when we started to explore well, what do you actually have on your device then? What, what sort of information? Oh, so you've got text messages that you've, you've exchanged with people, personal text messages, maybe some business-related ones. Or oh, you've got photographs on there, family photographs, things of that nature. So you're quite happy for other people to get access to that. Well, no, the pe people weren't quite that happy. And when they began to think about it, they, they were beginning to realize, and you could actually, we were doing focus groups, you could see the reactions on their faces they were visibly beginning to think that, okay, perhaps this is something that I do need to give a bit more attention to in terms of protection than I've currently got. And so we were confronted with people who hadn't got PIN numbers on their phones, so even the basic level of authentication that those devices offered. And I think after those focus groups, perhaps more people did. So if we think about what we're typically carrying around on these devices now, so here's a potentially typical looking smartphone, and here's just a selection of the sorts of things that many people will be holding on the device or allowing access to through the device. So many people will use the, the device to get their email. So again, for my information, wave your hands if your mobile device is used for your email in the room. Okay, so that's pretty much almost everybody. Um, anybody got photographs on their mobile device? Yeah, a few people, yeah. 
text messages, yes, appointments. What websites have you looked at? So you can see that from web history on the devices. And so access to social networks. How many people are on Facebook from their mobile device? A few people in the room, yeah. And, and how many of you now would happily get your device out of your pocket and just pass it to the person next to you or in the row behind you and let them start looking at all this stuff? Not that many. No, no, no hands visibly went up for that one. And, and again, this is the sort of thing that we find. So we did a, a, a little exercise of this nature with some young people recently at Plymouth. We did some presentations to them. And you know, we were asking them, well, do you have any sensitive information on your device? And no, was the, 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 the reaction at the start. And then, well, we, we showed this information and said, well, OK, how many of you now think you've got sensitive information? And a lot more hands went up at that point. And I say, this can just be in terms of individual information. We don't even need to start thinking about how this, some of the same information could be quite relevant to protecting organisations and businesses in which mobile devices are used or in which mobile devices are allowing access to corporate resources. So, for example, you know, the business email. How many people are taking their mobile device and being able to configure it so it downloads company email as well as personal stuff? So again, just as some illustration of the penetration here, some data from Kaspersky Lab, looking at the extent to which different categories of data are stored on different categories of these post-PC type devices. And again, I won't go through every one of those rows there, but just scan the slide for a moment. You can see that quite a lot of the devices are storing quite a lot of that information. Okay, so very, very much so, we've got a device or devices that are going around that are not only physically valuable in terms of the cost of the device itself, but the data content, the value to us as individuals, the value to our employers, is often going to vastly outweigh the actual monetary value of replacing the device. In many cases, the fact that the device itself might go missing is the least of your worries if the data on it isn't properly protected. Now this gives rise to some interesting considerations when you think about the way that people use these devices in the context of employment or in the context of organisations in which they're operating. So if we look at the way in which mobile devices might find their way into organisations, there are perhaps three main categories. One is where the organisation basically prescribes the device and they provide it to their employees, to their staff members, etc. And here, you've got something that is actually fully controllable by the organisation. They've given it, they've paid for it, and so they've got the right to mandate what it runs, how it's secured, what protection the user ought to be running. Okay, but in many cases, we've already established, people have got their own personal devices, and they might not want to carry around a completely separate mobile device for use by the business. Now, in some cases, they won't have a choice. That's the way the business wants to do it, and so that's what they're stuck with. And perhaps never the twain shall meet. You won't have business information on your personal device and no personal information on the business device. But in many cases, that's found to be not convenient, and the business, in many cases, won't have the resources or the desire to pay for all the devices that people are going to use. So what's become quite common is that the BYOD term, bring your own device, so now you've got people's personally owned devices being permitted to be used, and in fact, in many cases, being encouraged to be used for work-related purposes. Now, the, the potential issue here, of course, is that the organisation hasn't paid for it, and so it has much more limited rights, if any rights at all, over what it can say that the, the user has to be running on the device in order to protect it. So, in many cases, you've got situations where the business has merely allowed its users to configure, for example, organisational email to be downloaded onto the device, but then the device is being carried around perhaps with no tangible protection that if the device is lost or stolen, somebody can't just pick it up and start looking at what business-related content is actually stored on it, perhaps even sending messages in that, that regard as well. And of course, the users can do other things that might compromise or expose the device. So they could jailbreak their device if it's an iOS one. They could root it if it's an Android device, which again makes it more exposed to some of the threats that are out there in terms of malicious code and other sorts of hijacking. Perhaps the compromise 
solution, um, particularly where you've got users who desire to have a particular type of device. So some people like Android, some people like iOS devices better, and they don't want to be given one when they prefer the other, is the category of choose your own device. So the business will provide it, but gives the user some choice over the category of device that they want to have. So they've got the, the, the opportunity for some level of flexibility, but for the organisation it's a bit more manageable because they at least know all the different varieties that are going to be in place and they don't have to have, let's say, the in-house technical support to be able to advise on all the different permutations that users might have bought for themselves. But nonetheless, if you're going to do that, you're going to allow people to make personal use of the device as well, there perhaps need to be some boundaries established and some clear policy on what the device can be used for if the, if the organisation has provided it. And I said this issue of the ownership of the device versus what it's used for can, can quickly introduce some potential complications. So if you've got corporate data, business data held on a personal device, well, now you've got a device that the organisation, as I say, can't control, can't directly configure, so it can't set the parameters of protection. And as a result, it, the data on it might not receive the level of protection that the organisation would actually like to see. So if it was on a, an organisational PC, the organisation would know it's, it's got a certain level of network security, certain level of antivirus protection on it, certain level of authentication mandated, then it goes on to the user's own personal device, and perhaps it's there out in the wild, not properly protected. By contrast, if you've got a corporately provided device, so whether it's a choose-your-own device or a completely fixed device, but you're allowing the user to make some personal use of it, or they nonetheless choose that they're going to, then some types of personal data or personal uses might not be compatible with what the organisation would actually like. So some of the, the sites that users might visit, some of the things they might communicate or store. And so there is also the, uh, so the potential for that to become associated with the organisation, which might not be desirable if the device is lost and then not properly protected and people see, oh, they've, they've got this sort of data stored on it in this, this company. Equally, if you've stored your personal data on a device that the organisation has provided and is then wrapping into a corporate backup, you're going to potentially find your personal data, communications, appointments, getting wrapped up into what the organisation stores as part of its central repository, which again might not be quite so comfortable from the user perspective. So there's no single right way of doing it, but you've got to keep these considerations in mind if you're an organisation that's providing a device or conversely, allowing your data to be stored on somebody else's. And of course, this is now a mobile device. So one of the fundamental differences between that and a, a PC that spends all its time on a desk in an office is the device is physically vulnerable. It's going places with the user. It's vulnerable to theft. It's vulnerable to being left behind. If it's a smartphone, it can fall out of a pocket, fall out of a bag, etc. Um, so again, Kaspersky Lab data, they did a, a fairly large survey there. One in six of the users out of 8,600 have experienced some sort of damage, loss or theft of their mobile device. Now noting in this context mobile devices were also including laptops as well as the smartphones and tablets that I'm largely focusing on in the rest of the talk. Many of them found their devices damaged, so they needed to have had appropriate backups of the content in order to, to safeguard it. Several were lost and several were stolen. So worth recognising that these are desirable technology devices. Uh, in the UK, certainly in larger cities, there's reported instances quite commonly of these being snatched from people on the street when they're just using them and not paying attention, got the phone held up to their ear, etc. Somebody comes along, sees it, grabs it and runs off. And so, again, in the wrong hands, that's not only the device that's gone, that's the data content and that needs, a, that needs protection. So thinking about, well, what do we need to protect against and how do we do it? Any thoughts in the room? What do we need to protect against? I've given some clues. Any thoughts? Virus I can hear somewhere around there. So we need antivirus, so that's part of the how to do it. So that's a good answer on certain mobile platforms at least. Passwords, yes, passwords are a good option. 
Okay, so that's protecting against unauthorized use. Let, let's see the things that I put up. Uh, this is not an exhaustive set. This is just as many as I could be bothered to put on the slide. Um, okay, I've got malware in brackets there. I shouldn't have that there. I will talk about malware as well. Um, but some things to protect against. So unauthorized use of the device, the theft or loss of the device, we might not be able to protect against it happening, but there's certainly some safeguards we can take if the device has gone missing to protect the data content of it. It's useful to think about what data could leak from the device. Okay, so you've still got the device with you. Nobody else has physically got hold of it, but it still might be letting stuff escape that you're unaware of. And, of course, malicious code. So this, this brings into focus the need for things like authentication, the ability to do things remotely on the device, like lock it or even wipe the content when you, when you don't physically know where it is or you can't physically get hold of it to intervene, to have backups of the information on it and also to think about the privacy controls that you put on the data when it's on the device in your possession and, as I say, antivirus, which we'll come to as well later on. So let's think about each of these in turn, beginning with this issue of user authentication. Okay, now if, if we think about the traditional options that are available to us, I think almost everybody, if you've got a mobile phone device, and certainly if you've got a tablet, you will have the option for the bit that's on the, the near side to me here, the, the use of PINs, personal identification numbers. Okay, so even basic cellular phones allow the use of, of PIN numbers to protect the device. It's not necessarily comparable with the level of security that you would have, as I say, for the same data if it was on a desktop computer. You don't find many desktops protected with just a PIN, but they can have very much the same data as the mobile devices now. But a PIN is perhaps more convenient to use if it's a device that you're pulling in and out of your pocket all the time. Just looking at the contrast between those two interfaces on the screen there, these screenshots taken from iOS, as you'd find on, a, on an iPhone in this particular case, you can see that the interface for the pin is much more suited to, to somebody with fingers the size of mine tapping away on the screen than the password interface. So you can have what on iOS would be called, well, not a simple password, so you've got the option for simple password or normal password. The normal password can be more complicated, it can be more comparable with the length that you would have and expect to have on a desktop system, on a laptop or on websites. But to actually type that in on your mobile device frequently is going to be perhaps cumbersome, it's going to be irritating, and so perhaps not what many people actually want. So we'll, we'll think about that and the implications of that in some of the other options as we go. But it's worth considering also the extent to which people have authentication on their device at all. And from a survey that we did amongst uh, adult mobile device users in the UK recently, so back towards the end of last year, we asked them what sort of authentication they had on their device. And you can see the breakdown there. The majority view amongst uh, the mechanisms was the use of a PIN, um, largely, I would imagine, because it was the most convenient and also it's the one that is there on every device. Some people, you can see, had pattern lock, which is specific to the Android platform. We'll have a look at that as we go. But almost a fifth of people had no authentication at all. And that's worrying, again, when you think back to the types of data that they're almost invariably storing on those devices. So it's, again, perhaps the triumph of the usability of the device over the need to protect it, because perhaps they consider it just too inconvenient to have any level of security standing in the way of them using the device when they want to. So that sort of brings into question what is actually tolerable for the user and what is the appropriate balance that ought to be there. So what can they tolerate? What are they willing to go through each time to authenticate themselves to the device? More particularly, and this is the bit that many people won't start to think about, is what level of authentication, what level of protection does the data actually warrant having? Should it have more than just a simple PIN, a four-digit number, standing between an imposter and their access to that data if the device is lost or stolen? Does the device actually offer you a suitable option as an alternative? So if you say, OK, on my normal system, I've got this protected with a strong password. It's a 14-character password that I'm forced to change regularly. Does your mobile device have the option to allow that? I mean, the, con the more 
typical smartphone platforms now will do, whether you'll tolerate it is another matter, but some devices still won't. And that then begs the question, should some categories of data even be on the mobile device at all? Should they be allowed to escape onto a mobile platform, away from the organisation, let's say, where it can be more strongly protected? Should it be out there at all? And in many cases, it, it does end up being there because it's, again, convenient for people. But these questions ought to be asked, that, well, ideally by the organisation, but even as a, a level of personal risk assessment as to what has the risk of being exposed. So I say, if we think about the standard type of authentication on a desktop computer, on a website, it's typically a password. But how many of you have a password on your smartphone? How many of you use a normal type of password, eight characters or something like that? Okay, a few hands, maybe three or four or five. How many people have a PIN, a numeric sequence, four-digit number, something like that? Okay, a few more people, hands not going as high. How many people have no authentication at all? Just out of my out of interest. Ooh, a few more hands there. That's a bit dodgy. And how many people have something other than a pin, a password, or nothing? How many people have pattern lock, biometrics, or something of that nature? Uh, a few. Okay. If roughly the same number as had none at all. So okay. So we've got a variety of practices in the room. That's interesting. Relatively few people had a password, and I would suggest that one of the reasons, as I've said, is it can be time-consuming and awkward to actually enter a normal password on something like a mobile phone. It's a bit easier on a tablet because it's larger and it's got a bigger keyboard with more characters on it without you having to switch character sets, perhaps. But if you were typing, well, I've said 11 characters here. On the slides, I've actually simplified it. I've put a, a, an eight-character password, but it's still got some variety in the character set. So let's have a look. On an iPhone, entering, let's say, an eight-character password, um, which I call passcode. Um, I've written it in a few different character types. So I've got an uppercase letter, I've got a lowercase letter, I've got a symbol, and I've got a numeric in there. Um, instead of a, a, an O, I've got a zero. So that's several different types of characters. It's not a particularly long password. Eight characters isn't great, but the password space with four different character types, upper, lowercase, numeric, and symbol, that's not bad. Um, but in order to enter that password, I now have to alternate between three different sets of keyboard on the device. Some to get the uppercase and lowercase letters, some to get the symbols, and some to get the numerics. And so by the time I've switched between things, and if you watch me try to enter a passcode like that, you will notice me getting very confused, and it will probably take me 30 seconds to a minute to actually enter it properly by the time I've alternated between the different keypad settings. This isn't the sort of thing that is going to be very comfortable to do repeatedly if you're somebody, again like me, who takes your phone out of your pocket quite frequently to have a look at things, to check stuff in and out of your pocket all the time. This is going to be awkward. And so it's not the sort of thing that many people will find tolerable. So what tends to happen is perhaps they will gravitate towards something that is easier to enter. Okay, so something like the PIN, particularly a four-digit one because it's easier to remember as well, quick to enter, and you've got, as the interface shows, a larger keypad on which to do it. So it's less fiddly. You can do it without having to pick your, pick your spot quite so precisely on the keypad. And there is perhaps another compromise that can be made. You can at least, rather than just have a four-digit PIN, you can have a longer PIN. So on an iPhone, if you enter a password that is entirely numeric, you will still get, as it shows on the right-hand side there, on, on the left, depending which way you're looking, you will get the numeric keypad, but it will let you enter a longer number, and it won't show you how many digits it's got in it by default. So if it's a four-digit PIN, you can see there that it shows you it's four digits. On the other one, it doesn't tell you how many characters you're aiming for if you're an imposter. But these are, if you like, our traditional authentication methods. There are other things that are now emerging. So on tablet devices, um, so those that run Windows 8, for example, you can use this technique called a picture password. Has any, anybody used picture password on a Windows 8 device at all? Anybody got Windows 8? Uh, a couple of people. Okay, three, four. So what Picture Password allows you to do is you take an image and you select three secret points within that image. 
and you can then associate with those secret points three different types of gesture. You can have tapping a point, you can have drawing lines between points, or you can do a, a circle motion, circle gesture. So I'm highlighting on that slide there the three different types. On a, in use, it wouldn't highlight them like this. I'm just showing you sort of collected together to show the different permutations. And this is the sort of thing that might be more friendly for people on that sort of touch-based device, particularly on a, a tablet-sized screen, perhaps more so than a, a little mobile phone screen, and perhaps easier to enter, perhaps easier to remember for people using those devices. I must admit, my ability to recall them is not that, that good, but for some people it might work quite well. You do potentially have the risk, though, of people leaving smear marks and things like that on the screen. So if you look at the device in the right light, you might see where they've drawn lines and drawn circles, and that might give you a clue if you've then got the picture on the screen and you can see that and, and retrace the set, so to speak. And a similar issue actually um, affects pattern unlock on Android devices. How many people have got this as their means of authentication? Quite a few hands for that one. So this is something that's been specifically introduced on Android devices, and this is quite a friendly one from the perspective you now don't have to remember a numeric sequence or a password. You're now literally joining the dots on the screen in a certain order to create a secret pattern. And on the device itself, you don't have to configure it so it actually shows the pattern. Um, you can configure it such that it shows it as you trace it, but that perhaps makes it a little bit more vulnerable to somebody looking over your shoulder or observing it and, and getting a clearer idea of what you're doing. But actually, even if you've got somebody stood in front of you and you can't see the screen, the fact that they trace a particular pattern with their finger, you might even be able to work it out just from watching them without seeing the screen itself. And again, looking at the device in the right lighting conditions, you might see residual smear marks on the screen where somebody has, has repeatedly entered their pattern, unlocked pattern on there. So again, you need to be a little bit cautious to make sure the device screen is wiped every now and again so that it's not leaving those clues for potential imposters. So as I often say to people, the very first time I ever saw this technique in use was with one of our students, and he was quite happy to leave his mobile phone on the table while he went off somewhere else because it was locked. Nobody could do anything with it. No, we weren't going to steal it because he'd left it with us. Um, but one of the other students there picked it up had a look at it in the light, was able to see the, the pattern that was left on the screen from finger smudge marks, unlock the device, change the pattern, and put it back on the table. <laughs> so, so that when the student then came back, he spent a few interesting minutes trying to unlock his phone while everybody else around was sniggering because uh, they knew the pattern had been changed. And you want to avoid that situation, really. And so uh, making sure if you are using this technique that you at least don't have such greasy fingers and you wipe the screen is a good idea. But from the usability perspective, this is a good, good move for some people because it is potentially easier to remember. Okay, but it does come with potential downsides. And I say, this, this issue of usability versus the level of security is something we're increasingly seeing with the mobile devices. So if we think about both of the leading platforms now, and our, by leading platforms I'm referring to Android and iOS on mobile devices, they've both now introduced some form of biometric technique. So authenticating somebody by what they are or what they do, um, as opposed to something they have to remember or some physical possession that they have with them. So on Android, since late 2011, there's been the facility to do facial unlock. And on iOS, more recently, towards the end of last year, with the launch of the iPhone 5S, there's fingerprint recognition, or Touch ID, as Apple have called it. And so there you just present your finger or thumbprint to the device and it unlocks. Okay, so this is quite nice on the mobile devices because, as I say, many people use the devices frequently and for short bursts. So typing the password, tiresome, and inconvenient, etc. Whereas being able to do this is actually quite compatible with the way the device is naturally used anyway. So if we look at these in turn, we've got the Android facial unlock, and we've got it here charmingly modelled by one of our colleagues, Liam, back in Plymouth. So this is Liam uh, registering his face on the device. Um, and so the way you register it is you, you hold the phone up, you show it who you are, what you look like, and it will learn your face pattern. And that's very nice. It's the way we as humans are used to recognising each other. 
So it's letting the technology do the same thing. And then when you want to authenticate yourself, when you want to use the phone, you take it out of your pocket, you hold it up, and the phone sees you and it unlocks. Okay. There are some potential downsides here, which we'll probably come on to in a moment, but let's, uh, let's talk about iOS's approach first. Um, so iOS, with the, the Touch ID, the idea now is you've got this um, RF capacitive sensor that's been built into the home button on the device. This is quite nice in the sense that the home button is something that you press fairly naturally to switch the device on and to, to interact with it in other ways. So in addition to just enabling you to turn the device on, it can now sense your fingerprint, your thumbprint, and only unlock if you're the correct user. Okay, um, just noting, because it's always a question that comes up around fingerprint recognition, and at least they've thought about it in this context, that the capacitive sensor utilizes the slight electrical signal that a live finger produces. So if it's a dead finger, if it's one that's been chopped off uh, just to, to masquerade as somebody else, and like, or you, you've killed the user, it won't work. Okay, so you do need a live user to operate it. And uh, on the iPhone platform, or in this context, not only can it be used to unlock the device, you can also configure it such that you can confirm purchases on the iTunes store as well. So rather than just having to enter your password, you present your finger or thumbprint, whatever you've, you've registered, and that will then only enable the legitimate user to make the purchase. Um, and it's worth noting the user can register up to five fingers or thumbs um, on the device. So you've got multiple options. So particularly if you've you perhaps damaged your skin on a finger, you, you're not dependent on just one of your digits to unlock it. Or if you were so choose, you can register fingers from other people that you want to share the device with as well, if you're quite confident they're not going to misuse it. But the thing here is that this is perhaps prioritizing the usability of the technique over the security that it provides. And neither Google with, with Android when they were promoting facial unlock or Apple in their promotion of Touch ID are saying this is the most secure way of doing it. So Apple's promotional text for Touch ID, the rationale for including it is you check your iPhone dozens and dozens of times a day, probably more, entering a passcode slows you down. It's not saying, notably, fingerprint recognition on this phone is stronger than the password. In fact, we'll explicitly see in a moment that that's not how they're presenting it. And for facial unlock, the point was that it's making the device more personal. It's not saying it's making the device more secure. And actually, if you look at how on Android the protection is ranked, and you've got your options for how you unlock the device, you see that face unlock there is listed <coughs> as the least secure of the available options, or at least the available options that require you to do something other than swipe the screen. So it says it's less secure than any of the secret-based approaches you could be using. So pattern unlock, PIN, or password, it's saying face unlock is less secure than all of those. And that's odd in the context that normally when we've seen about biometrics in the literature over the years, they're being presented as a more secure approach than secret knowledge, than passwords and pins. We'll see why it's less secure in a moment. Okay, so it explicitly says, face unlock is less secure than a pattern, pin, or password. It's there right on the screen as part of your decision-making process. So why is it less secure? One reason is that it's not been implemented in quite the most advanced way that you could do face recognition, okay? Another way, another reason is that, well, actually, in some cases, it's not that usable. So think about the scenario of trying to use your facial unlock in the dark. Think about the scenarios where you often will pull your phone out in poor lighting conditions. You can still use the phone because its screen lights up, but its camera can't see your face, and so it wouldn't be able to use that technique to unlock. So you still need something as a fallback where face recognition won't actually work for you. More interestingly from the security perspective is, well actually, because it's not that robust an implementation of face recognition, it is vulnerable to being spoofed. And so this particular picture on the screen is from a video we've got on our iTunes U collection. And it's my colleague Nathan Clark holding up his Android phone with face recognition enabled on it, and holding up to that phone his iPhone with a picture of his delightful face on it. 
And what it's doing is the Android phone is seeing his picture on the iPhone and it unlocks. Okay, it will unlock in response to a static photograph in that version of the face recognition approach. On more recent versions of Android, they've incorporated what's called liveness detection. So it, it, it won't work for just a static photograph because it requires you to blink and the camera needs to see you blink to prove it's actually a live user. But that also is vulnerable to spoofing because basically, well, you can have an edited photograph where you've got it animated so it opens and shuts the eyes. You can create a, an eyes shut photograph. If you've got an eyes open one, you can quite happily edit the picture and shut the eyes. But also, um, you could take a static photograph and cut holes in it, hold it up to your face and blink behind it. <laughs> and, and that again has been demonstrated to work against the, I say, the fairly rudimentary face recognition that the Android devices can do. So it's nice for convenience, but it does weaken the level of security. And again, if we look at iOS with Touch ID, well, okay, what happens if the fingerprint recognition approach doesn't work? Well, what actually happens is it falls back to your passcode. If, for, if at first it doesn't recognize your finger, it says try again, and you get a few more attempts, and the device buzzes and vibrates if you've got it set in that mode. After a third consecutive failure, it drops back to the passcode um, in order to then let you authenticate via that. It's given up using your fingerprint by that point, and it said you've got to use your passcode. And also, if you've got five consecutive failures, the passcode is mandatory. And also, if you've reset the device, if you've done a hard reset, then you've got to use the passcode to re-authenticate yourself and re-enable the device um, before it can be used again with the fingerprint, even if that's working. So users can't actually use Touch ID without setting a passcode first. You've got to have that as the fallback. So if you wish to change any of the authentication settings, you've then got to use the passcode. Say, if you've done a full reset, and if you've not used the device for 48 hours, although I can't imagine anybody not using their mobile phone for 48 hours, you've then got to use the passcode to unlock them instead of your fingerprint. Um, so interestingly then, what you're doing is relying on a passcode that you actually don't use as frequently, and perhaps you might be more likely to forget than if it was one you were using regularly every time you unlock the device, perhaps. And regarding usability of the, uh, the Touch ID approach, well, there are some situations in which it won't work. So, okay, face recognition, you can't use it in the dark, Fingerprint recognition, you can't use it if you've got wet fingers, which could happen if your hands are sweaty, or if, like me the other day, you got caught in the rain here, um, you know, then you can press your finger on the, the home button as much as you like, it won't unlock the phone. If your fingers are a bit dirty, then the, the device won't be able to read them. If you're wearing gloves, which if you came to the UK and you, you experienced the winter climate there, you might be tempted to wear gloves, because it gets a bit cold. And also, if you've got damaged skin. And so we have here, and I'll do a close-up for you so you can see it, um, the next presenter's thumb. Um, so this was uh, just after Maria had tried to unlock her Touch ID protected iPhone and didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was she's got a bit of uh, scuffing on her fingerprint there. And it couldn't recognize that as the, as the right finger. The one that had been, well, it's a thumb, but the one that had been registered with it. And so again, all of these circumstances could mean that your nice and usable touch ID approach suddenly becomes not so usable after all. Okay, so all of these are things to bear in mind. It doesn't make them bad approaches, but it means they can't be relied upon to be the only solution. So one of the things we've considered as part of our research at Plymouth is how to actually make mobile device authentication more usable by having different options that you could bring together. So here, what I've got pictured is a fairly dated mobile device, but it relates to some prototype work that we did on it. Taking all of those different authentication mechanisms and fusing them together into a composite approach. So if the user was interacting on the touch screen, then you could do, well, I've turned it signature recognition there, but you could do more handwriting recognition with the stylus that that device used. If they were speaking, you could do voice recognition through the microphone. If they were typing, if they were using the keypad, you could do so-called keystroke dynamics, authenticating somebody by the way that they type. 
If they're looking at the camera, you could do face recognition and you could generally profile the utilization of applications and data on the device. Now notably, this device in the top corner there also has a fingerprint sensor, but it requires an explicit action. The user has to swipe their finger over the sensor. And they would only ever do that because they were asked to do it for security. What we are interested in is leveraging the user's natural interactions with the device without security having to ask for anything specific at all. Another thing that relates to some of our current research is our so-called authentication aura, recognizing that people have got multiple mobile devices, or multiple devices, some of them mobile, some of them fixed a lot of the time. And if you've authenticated yourself recently on one of them to a suitable strength of, of identity verification, perhaps you don't need to authenticate yourself explicitly on another one in close succession to that if you can already take confidence from the authentication decision that's just been made. So this is talking about having interactions between your devices in your own personal network so they can give confidence to each other rather than each of them separately asking you to do something explicitly to authenticate. And I say, in terms of some simulation work that we've done, we've worked out this can lead to up to a 75% reduction in the number of explicit authentication requests you might get asked for. So it's again, trying to improve the usability here, but hopefully without the cost of security. All right, another category of problem. I've talked about authentication quite a lot. Let's think about some of these physical threats of um, loss and theft of the device and what can be done there. So I'll use the iOS context as an example here of what you can do, but other platforms offer something similar in, in several cases. So if you, uh, if you lose a device or if it's stolen, then not only the device is gone, it's also your data. And having the ability to do something to still safeguard the data could be quite useful. So on iOS, you've got a Find My iPhone or Find My iPad app that you can utilize if you've got it enabled on all of your devices. And so this is what the, the startup interface looks like. And what you can then see on a map to physically show you where they are is where your devices were last known to be. So those ones that are active and switched on, you can get a live report of where they physically are, which is quite useful if you believe a device has been lost or if, it, if you think it's been stolen, because it might help you to track it and track it down. So if there is a problem, if you think something has gone wrong, you simply can't find your device or you know that it's been stolen, what can you do? So you've got three options there from the bottom of the screen. So the first one, playing a sound, might be quite useful if you just don't know where the device is, maybe you think it's even lost at home or in the office, and you just want to get it to make a sound so you can physically locate where it might be. You get go beep, and you might go, ah, I can hear it's over there, I'll go and pick it up. If that doesn't work, and you, you can't hear it making a sound when you ask it to do so, and you think, okay, it is genuinely lost, and it might be in the wrong hands, you can then invoke something called lost mode which basically then will disable the device and stop somebody else from using it. So let's have a look at what that means. So you can turn it on, and then you can provide your contact number so that if then somebody does find the device, they've got a means of contacting you and saying that they've found it. And you can also put a message on the screen of the lost device as well as your contact number, pleading with somebody to please give it back to you. Okay, so those are the things that you would do to initiate this mode. And then, once you've invoked lost mode, you can still see where your lost device is, if it's still active and switched on, but you can now see it's got that little red lock symbol against it to show that you've protected it. On the device itself, so on that, that previous screen was what you'd be looking at on the tracking device, so your iPhone, if you've lost your iPad, as in this case. On the screen of the lost device, so in this case it's an iPad, it's now saying, I'm a lost iPad, um, the message that you've put on there to ask somebody to please return it to you, and the contact number to use. So now, unless you know how to unlock the device, unless you know the authentication credentials for this device, you can't do anything with it, but you can see that it's been lost and you've got a means of contacting the legitimate owner. And then, as the owner, the registered owner of the device, you also get emails to tell you what's actually happened. So you can see that lost mode has been activated. You can also then get notified when the device is discovered and unlocked again. If you're really concerned and you want to do more than just lock the device, you can also wipe its contents. 
So this will erase all of the content on the device so that even if you actually find it again, so it was behind the sofa after all, hadn't been stolen, now you've actually lost the data. Okay, so you want to be sure before you wipe it. But as, as I say, in some cases, the value of the data on that device might be such that you don't want to risk anybody being able to get hold of it, even if the device is locked. Uh, locked. So this, I say, is the ultimate safeguard, perhaps, for your data. But if you have lost the device, if you've wiped it, etc., what's quite useful to have also is to have had a backup of the data on the device in the first place. And so this is relevant to consider, particularly again for these fairly data-rich devices that we're carrying around. <coughs> Having a backup, which you could do locally to the, the computer that you perhaps synchronized with, or increasingly now backing up data into the cloud. So on the, the iOS platform, you've got the Apple iCloud service, which gives you a certain allocation of data to begin with, purchase more. And again, you can back the data up into the cloud, and that also has potentially the advantages of synchronizing things with your other devices as well. So you've got perhaps more availability of data. We'll come on to that also. But having a backup of the, the data is worth remembering. And it's, often, it's always been a, a good security safeguard, and it's always been one that, that people tend to overlook quite a lot of the time. So worth mentioning again here. Now, so sharing data, backing up data to the cloud, or, or sharing more generally with cloud services and other, thing, other ways of sharing data between apps on the devices, does introduce this, this question of whether your device is potentially leaking data that it ought not to be, and managing your privacy. So even if you've still got the device, it's with you, um, nobody else has got hold of it physically, there still could be data being sent from the device that you're not aware of unless you've carefully configured and looked at your privacy settings. So, so the fact that you can actively share data to the cloud could, could mean that, okay, you're sharing the data off to the cloud, which is then being shared to other devices that you don't physically have with you. So they might be back in the office. You might have left them out in the open. Somebody else could get hold of them. And there are also things, that, as shown here um, on the iCloud, interface, um, but even more particularly here, when we look at the privacy settings for various apps, various bits of information within your, your device and within apps themselves that other apps might be interested to get hold of. So location information, details of your calendar, access to your camera roll on the device to take or put things into your photographs. All of this can be used quite legitimately, quite happily between certain apps because you want to allow them to share. But equally, if you're not aware that the sharing is occurring, that could introduce problems. So um, let's use an example. So, so you've got, particularly if we think about cloud services, so various platforms, we'll stick with iCloud as an example. And on the interface there, you've got this thing called PhotoStream. Um, on Apple devices. So you've got the camera roll on the device of the photos that you've taken that are stored on the device. But if you enable photo stream, what it does is uses the iCloud service to share your photos with other devices that are registered on your account. So you, you, you'd have actively enabled this um, on your other devices. They're all registered and set up to use iCloud. But if you weren't aware that photo stream was operating, then perhaps you wouldn't be aware that your photos, when you take them on one device, are instantly available to the other devices, which might not always be in your possession. So let's think about a scenario, and I'll have a little quote from a user afterwards that shows that this is the sort of scenario that can occur. Sharing by a photo stream. So here is an iPhone. A user who we will call Nathan takes a photo with his iPhone. We don't know what he's taking a photo of, but let's assume this is a photo that for some reason Nathan doesn't want to share. Okay, not openly. This might be an inappropriate photo. It might be a photo that shows Nathan is in a location he didn't say he was in. Okay. Now that photo, because he's got photo stream enabled, is shared into the cloud. And that's where his photo is now sitting. Well, back at home, Nathan has an Apple TV, let's say. And uh, that Apple TV is connected to the, the family TV. And that's where his photos are now being displayed. Because that Apple TV is using <laughs> iCloud as well. He's all sharing data across his account. 
And so all of a sudden, that photo that Nathan shouldn't have taken because he didn't say that he was in Las Vegas uh, gambling in slot machines, he said he was working at a conference. And this, uh, if any of you know my colleague Nathan, this is exactly the sort of thing he would say, no, no, I'm at a conference, I'm working hard. And then you see him <laughs> taking pictures of slot machines. And then suddenly that appears on the Apple TV. That rather betrays the reality of what he's been doing. Okay? And other people can now see that. And that's a, that's a fairly innocent example. But this is the, this is the thing with, with iCloud and with PhotoStream in particular. This is how it was originally configured. I think now you can have a little bit more control. But originally, what it would do is store your last thousand photographs for 30 days. And once they were in there, you couldn't delete them from the cloud. You could delete them from the device, but they were there stuck in the iCloud for 30 days. Um, one user on a discussion board said, that's useless. Um, so every photo I take, every photo, whether it's blur or that, that's stuck with me for 30 days and I can't do anything about it. So if somebody takes my phone and visits some dodgy sites and takes photos of that, I can't do anything to remove that information. And it's all associated with me. Okay, so these are considerations in terms of the mobile device and what it might be sharing with other things. And again, you've got the means to configure it differently, but you need to be aware as a user that those configuration settings are there. Okay, final category of threat as we draw to a close is that of malware. And this is a growing problem for mobile devices, particularly, I will say, for Android devices. Um, so for many years when we had PDAs and the initial uh, mobile phones, people were, were saying, oh, are these going to be a problem with malware? And there was no real evidence of it, but the antivirus vendors were all saying, no, no this, this could be a potential target. And over time, this has been proven right. Okay, So finally, um, it's not a good thing, but finally there is strong evidence of this malware problem on mobile devices in the same way that we've had that problem on PCs for, for many years. Now, it's nowhere near the same scale as you see on Windows and, and that, that sort of popular platform, but it is there on mobile devices and it is a real problem um, that you could be exposed to. So I say Android in particular is at risk. Um, and so antivirus, if you're an Android user, really ought to be something on your device or at least on your list to put on it. And the reason being, if we look at, um, so this is some Kaspersky data from 2012, so um, reflecting the, the entirety of that year. Okay, 98.96% of the detected malware was on Android um, for, for mobile devices, and very little, as you can see, on other platforms. iOS there doesn't even get an explicit mention. You can get malware on iOS devices if you jailbreak them, and there have been examples of malicious code finding their way into the app store, but it quickly gets eradicated. On Android, you've got very many more routes by which you could encounter it. And to look at the scale of the problem growing, if you look at January 2011, there were just eight <coughs> new discoveries of malware that month. The average across 2011 was 800 new strains per month. And then in 2012, the average was 6,300 new strains. So nowhere near the, the many thousands that you would get on Windows, for example, but a much bigger problem than it has been in the past. And so it's one that people need to be aware of. And there are various things that the malware could do. So you've got SMS Trojans that start sending messages um, to premium numbers on your behalf, generating revenue for somebody else. You've got things that can open back doors on your device and allow data to leak. And you've got spyware, which again is allowing data leakage from the device. But looking at people's attitudes and awareness towards the need for antivirus on mobile devices, it doesn't seem to be quite there. So um, I did put some flyers at the back of the room with some data from this survey, but I'll, I'll pull out a, a couple of examples. We asked these 290 adult respondents in September, October last year, what use of antivirus software do you make then? And on their desktop or laptop systems, 95% of them reported that they had some. Okay? It was a standard security safeguard on that sort of platform. But only 14% of them said they had it on their smartphone. Okay, so we specifically were asked about smartphones, we didn't talk about tablets. Um, on smartphones, only 14%. So, okay, some smartphone platforms you don't really need it, but Android you do. 
So we looked specifically then at the Android respondents. So 142 of the respondents had an Android device, and only a quarter of them had antivirus on their Android phone. So with this problem growing, this is an increasing route for exposure on that platform, and it is something that needs attention. Okay. Organizations sometimes aren't that much better. So looking at the Information Security Breaches Survey in the UK from last year, okay, only 8% of organizations said they'd done nothing to deal with mobile device risks, but what they had done wasn't exactly uniform. So only 59% had, had a strategy for mobile devices and securing them. Only two thirds of them had a security policy that related to mobile computing. 50% had implemented device management so they could control the use of the device. But 61% allowed staff to connect to corporate systems via their personal devices. So there was, and, and it was notable as it says that small organisations fared far, far worse than large ones in terms of having things like policy in place. Now the thing is that with, with concepts like bring your own device being encouraged, to allow people to work on the move and without organisations having to, to pay for the technology. There is a need at least to have policy in place and for people to be aware of it if this is actually going to work in an effective, protected, secure manner. Okay? So organisations in particular ought to be taking this on board. If you're going to allow the use of it, you need to have a position that, that's promoted to the users on it. So some final points in conclusion. So what I'm not trying to do here is suggest that in any sense smartphones, tablets are a problem in and of themselves. They give us great opportunity, they give us great convenience personally and business-wise to work on the move. But we must recognise that they are great amplifiers of the risk that we face. Okay, the, the same data we would have protected quite strongly when it's on a machine fixed in position in an office behind closed doors in a secure building is now with us on the move in a physically vulnerable environment. Okay, so in addition to the physical protection, you need to think about the fact people might pick them up and try to use them, the unauthorised use, the fact that they could leak your data even when you've still got them with you, and the fact that you've got, particularly on the Android platform, this increasing risk of malicious code that could come along and do quite a number of things to the data on your device or your account as a result. And from the organisational perspective, you've got this complication of whose device is it and who has the rights to prescribe what protection for it. So for individuals, what we need to do is we need to think about not only the fact it's a device that costs us some money, but the fact that it's got data on it that's actually important to us as well. We need to be aware of the safeguards that the device offers. I mean, many of them will have these privacy controls. They'll certainly have level of authentication you can enable. So being aware of what that is, is is quite sensible. But we also need to be aware of the physical risk of the device when we take it around with us. For organisations, basically, unless you're so locked down that you can actually be very strongly certain that mobile devices are not entering your organisation and you are not allowing people to configure access to your services through their mobile device, except that whether you've issued the device or not, your organisation is using mobile computing in some way. Recognise that that means there's a need for a policy on it and people need to be aware of the policy because you are actively trying to promote it to people, not just writing it and assuming they get it by osmosis. Okay, so there are things to be done at both individual and organisational levels. Thank you very much indeed.